Hello everyone, welcome back to Psychology 32, Lifespan Development. Today we're going to go over Chapter 11, which is Biosocial Development for the Middle Childhood Age. So we're talking about now 7 to adolescence, so between um, that young child, early childhood age, and um, adolescence, everything up to uh, and before adolescence. Okay, we're going to talk about physical changes, we're going to talk about some behavioral things to pay attention to, um, but overall, this um, this chapter shouldn't be that long. Okay, some of the biggest changes uh, that happen in this age um, are interpersonal. They're social because one of the biggest things that happens is school. That's one of the biggest changes, right? Children at the age of um, six, seven, eight, you're talking about, are now going to kindergarten, elementary school, etc. And there's a very, very big difference in their day-to-day -day functioning. You know, instead of being around people that they've known since birth, instead of being around people that they'll spend the rest of their lives with, they're surrounded by, in essence, strangers. A lot of them will become friends, and um, a lot of them might become very close with the individual, but they're surrounded by strangers. And they're interacting with children that don't necessarily resemble them in every way possible, right? They're from different cultures, from different religions, from different races, from different backgrounds, different levels of socioeconomic status. Um, and so these social demands um, become very prevalent in the individual's life, okay? Um, typically this age, uh, in general, the growing slows down. They'll go through a growth spurt again at puberty. Um, the, the things that they can do for themselves tends to increase. Um, their muscle control and definition tends to increase. And at this period in time, these children tend to be quite healthy. And there are a couple of different reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons is quite unfortunate. You know, the unfortunate reason as to why children this age are quite healthy is because a lot of the younger children that have had very, very serious illnesses that might have been born with um, congenital defects or might have been born um, or acquired serious illnesses early on um, might not have made it to this age. Um, so there's almost this attrition process that happens where the ones that survive, the children that have survived this long, tend to be healthier. So that's one thing. Um, the second reason is is that we talked about injury, uh, accidental death um, in early childhood, and these children have grown out of that a little bit, where their prefrontal cortex is getting a little bit uh, more well-developed, and they do a little bit of a better job anticipating potential dangers in their environment and choosing to not do things that might be harmful. And that's not to say they still don't do silly things and dangerous things they do, but at this age, they tend to be doing um, they tend to be doing uh, fewer of those things, and they tend to be thinking them through. Okay. Um, all right. Let's keep going. All right. So, two most common health problems um, in the United States, particularly, are going to be asthma and obesity, and we'll talk a little bit about um, each one of those quickly. So, obesity. We're talking about excess weight. All right, and you can measure obesity on a couple of different scales. Um, the, the common measure for obesity is what they call the BMI, which is the body mass index, where I always forget the exact conversion, but they take your height in, um, I believe it's millimeters, and they divide that by your weight in, I believe, kilograms, and they square that off and then they get a number. Um, and there are different ranges. Uh, of where your BMI should be. So in essence, um, the, you know, the, there are recommendations for what your BMI should be. And it's a regular number, the BMI. It doesn't matter what your height is. Because if you look at the, the calculation, your height is accounted for in the BMI. So in essence, um, everybody gets a number. And it's supposed to be a relative number. And whatever your relative BMI is, um, they would put you within a range. The range would be you know, normal, um, mildly obese, moderately obese, or morbidly obese. Um, and they obviously are going to want people in the normal range. There's a big debate in the industry um, where you talk about people who are obese but are healthy, and is obesity okay if you know your relative, if your overall level of health is good? It's hard to say, but the general recommendations now are that obesity is dangerous in the long run; it's problematic, and so 
um, you know, recommendations are to, you know, prevent or reduce obesity. Couple of things um, that are typically found um, more frequently in children who are obese. Um, later in life, higher blood pressure, um, type two diabetes, heart disease, stroke, Children who are obese tend to do more poorly in school, have lower self-esteem, they tend to have fewer friends, um, they tend to be more isolated, and all these tend to be associated with obesity. And, and you know, the long-term conditions associated with obesity, um, both physical and interpersonal, tend to, to increase with age. Um, obesity seems to affect uh, individuals on kind of every domain possible. One of the, the big things with obesity that's important to understand is, is that obesity can be increased with, with a couple of different things. Number one are the number of fat cells in your body. The more fat cells that you have, the greater your potential to be obese. Um, number two, genetics. Number three, there's a hormone called leptin. Um, you don't need to know that for, for, the, for the class, but it's just worth knowing. Leptin is a hormone that protects against weight loss. So in times of famine, the people that have more leptin um, are less likely to lose weight. And so, you know, it's an evolutionary quality, right? So people with leptin may have survived longer and, and healthier through times of famine. But now in the United States, for a good number of us, um, food is widely available and food is available in excess. And if that's the case, um, and you're eating food in excess, uh, and you have more leptin, it makes it difficult to lose weight, and you hold on to that weight more. One of the things that tends to happen is is that there's a um, there's there's a change that happens in the body at puberty. So prior to puberty, the number of fat cells in your body can go up or down. If you gain weight, more fat cells. If you lose weight, fewer fat cells. After puberty there's a change. After puberty, the number of fat cells in your body doesn't change. Okay, that stays the same. What changes are the sizes of the fat cells. So when you lose weight after puberty, you don't lose fat cells. You just shrink the fat cells that are there. When you lose weight before puberty, you lose the fat cells. And this is important because think about these fat cells as sponges. And so if you lose weight after puberty, think about shrinking those sponges. Well, what's going to happen if you eat food that has calories in it? Those sponges are going to inflate very, very quickly, right? Just like if you take a sponge that's dried out and you put water on it, it expands and grows very quickly. So what happens is, is that if you were obese prior to and through puberty, after puberty, if you lose weight, you're going to shrink those fat cells. But very shortly after you start eating high calorie foods and things like that, immediately those fat cells are going to start, you know, sucking up those calories and expanding again. So in essence, once you go through puberty and you're obese, you have these cells that are always kind of looking to grow and get larger. And it's very, very easy to put weight back on, and it's very hard to keep it off. So there's a big push nowadays to have children become more of a healthy weight prior to puberty, because in essence, um, if you don't, you have to spend the rest of your life actively maintaining a body weight that is healthy, because you're basically, you know, fighting to keep these um, keep these fat cells shrunken, for, for lack of a better way of putting it, okay? So there are a lot of efforts nowadays to um, keep children at a healthy weight prior to puberty. And it's not to say that after puberty you give up, you can eat whatever you want. If you were skinny during puberty, you'd be fine now. But it is to say that it's a lot easier to be fine later um, if, you were, if you were not obese at and through puberty. Okay, a couple of different ways to avoid obesity. One of them is physical play. Okay, playing, interacting, uh, getting outside, and there's a lot of interpersonal benefits and emotional benefits to play as well. Um, it's one of the most important things that, um, that, that children 
the children have. And hopefully you read that play article we talked about in that mentioned play as well. Um, but there are many, many benefits to physical play. Physical play, going outside, okay, running around, climbing on jungle gyms, right, running around the schoolyard, things like that. There are a lot of benefits to physical play, better overall health, um, less obesity. And now, when we talk about things like appreciation of cooperation and fair play, improved problem solving abilities, um, respect for teammates and opponents, all that kind of stuff, you know, this implies that there's um, supervision there, okay because there is a difference between what we call free play and organized play, okay? Um, free play is unsupervised play. Organized play is play where there's an adult there. And I don't want to go sort of too much into the differences between each one because each one has benefits and drawbacks. But when we're talking about organized play, there are many, many benefits to organized play, um, and there are also some drawbacks. A lot of the benefits are going to be appreciation of cooperation, the ones that you see here, right? These are some of the benefits of organized play. Um, assuming that the organizer, the coach, or who's ever supervising the teacher, who's ever in charge, is, is supporting these things, right? If you leave kids on their own just to play and you ignore them, well, there are benefits to that and drawbacks to that as well. Um, some of the drawbacks are going to be that it can be isolating for children who are less athletic. Some kids might get bullied or left out. Um, you know, the kids will group with like groups. You know, we, we like to believe that children don't have any prejudices. And the truth is, they don't necessarily have prejudices. But that doesn't mean that children don't gravitate towards what's familiar, which could end up in grouping. Um, and, and children that end up in homogeneous groups, okay? Um, not because of discriminatory behavior, purely because, you know, children go with what's familiar to themselves. Um, so you have to make sure that when you're playing, you make sure that everybody has equal opportunities to participate, everybody has equal opportunities to be involved. I mean, all of these things are very important. At the same time, you can get teachers and coaches and supervisors of organized play that um, emphasize the wrong things. They might emphasize competition, they might emphasize winning, they might emphasize um, play that might be unfair. And again, I'm not saying that it's not okay to encourage your child to succeed and to encourage your child to play hard. Um, all that's fine. But it's also important to make sure that you're not pushing the child to the point at which nothing else matters other than winning. Okay, because uh, you can imagine the, the, the um, adverse effects that this can have on the child um, and their peer group and everything else. Um, but not to go too far off on a tangent. So play is very, very important for overall physical health. Okay, all right, um, let's keep going. Organized versus free play, I, did, I went over this a little bit. I'm not gonna talk about this too much more. Um, let's talk a little bit about the other big health crisis and that's asthma, okay? Asthma in the United States, the numbers are skyrocketing. And it seems to be that pollution has a direct effect on asthma. Um, and we can see this uh, specifically or particularly in the Bronx. Um, the Bronx in New York has the, high, the, the largest number of highways per population, and it also has the highest asthma rates. You know, there is a strong relationship between pollution and asthma. Okay. Um, now, there are other things that can contribute to asthma, allergens, genetics, obviously, um, things like that. There's mixed research on pets in the home. Most of the research on pets in the home says the same thing, which is that early exposure to pets reduces allergies, reduces asthma. There is some research that says early exposure to pets might actually increase asthma, um, but most of the allergen and histamine research says that early exposure to pets um, does reduce asthma so and does reduce allergies in the long run so that one um, the pets in the home one is sort of a question mark okay so um, but it's just something that that's mentioned in the literature quite a bit but um, pollution there's no question that pollution causes you know tremendous increases in the rates of asthma and asthma can be terrible you know, it sometimes is not just about a little bit of breathing difficulty in a rescue inhaler. You know, I've seen children, I used to work in a hospital in the Bronx, 
I have seen children sitting there on those nebulizers, sitting there on those breathing machines in the emergency room for hours and hours and hours. And I'm talking about little kids. I'm talking about two-year-olds, one-year-olds sitting on their mom's lap as they have this device covering their mouth and nose and or, or this device in their mouth and they're inhaling it for hours and hours and hours trying to get um, their airways open again and trying to breathe. And there are very few things that are more sad than watching, you know, a one and a half year old spend, you know, her, her Tuesday night or her Wednesday night instead of sitting home and playing or, um, you know, watching something on television, sitting in the hospital in the psych emergency room, you know, tied to this machine uh, so that she could breathe or he could breathe. You know, it's a, it's a terrible thing to see. So, um, you know, pollution contributes to that tremendously. So there are things that we can do about pollution. All right. Um, now, brain development. Okay. So I want to talk about this a little bit because the slide might be a little bit confusing. First, um, as you mature, your brain becomes massively interconnected, meaning that neurons will grow, neurons will um, form connections with other neurons, they'll grow dendrites, um, and your brain will be able to send information back and forth more quickly to more areas of the brain more quickly, um, and the brain becomes massively interconnected. One of the major consequences or one of the major things that happens because of this is a decrease in reaction time and this is something that's very confusing okay so let me explain this a little bit better because this is something that that you probably will see on a test hint hint um, but it's also something that um, is very confusing reaction time is the time that it takes to respond to something so if I were to throw a ball at you the length of time it takes for you to raise your hand to catch the ball is your reaction time. The longer it takes, the slower you're reacting. The shorter, the less time it takes, the faster you're reacting. If the brain is more interconnected and the brain is functioning better, you can move faster. If you move faster, it results in less reaction time. So if I throw the ball at you and you move more slowly, it might take you two seconds to raise your hand. If I throw the ball at you and you move more quickly, it might take one second to raise your hand. That is a decrease in reaction time. The more interconnected the brain, the lower the reaction time. Okay? All right. Now, um, again, as the brain gets more well-developed and interconnected, um, the, the brain allows for more self-control, planning for the future. Um, it allows the, the brain to focus on different types of information and ignore other types of information. One of the things that becomes very important is something that we call selective attention, which is the, excuse me, which is the ability for the child to focus on one thing and tune something else out. Okay? If you've ever watched a baby or an infant, any stimuli gets their attention. Right? You can be holding a bottle in one hand, a spoon in the other. You know, you'll hold the bottle up, they'll look at the bottle, then you shake the spoon, they'll turn and look at the spoon, then you shake the bottle, they'll go back, look at the bottle again. It's like that video of the penguins with the flashlight, the head going back and forth. Um, infants are like that because they, they can't not sort of focus on something if it becomes part of their, um, part, part of their visual field. Um, Children have the ability at this age to start focusing in on certain things and tuning other things out, and that's partly to do with how efficient the brain becomes. So children can watch television and ignore their parents when the parents are talking to them, um, and they can tune things out. And as frustrating as that is, that they are tuning things out, on some level it's a developmental advancement and it's an important ability, because think about it the other way. I mean, we live in New York, and imagine being in a New York City public school with no ability to tune out sounds or outside noise when you're trying to read something or, or outside noise when your teacher's talking to you. I mean, that's pretty, pretty difficult to function. You have to be able to tune those things out, okay? Um, and this happens as the child gets older. 
Okay, so this is the age where the child can split the class into two groups. One group she'll read with, the other group works on a you know an assignment, and then they might split up. You know, the she might flip it. So the other the group that's working assignment she'll read to, or he'll read to, and then the other group will work on the assignment, and they won't be distracted by the reading in the background because they start to have the ability to selectively attend to information. Okay, now this is something I spent a little bit of time on, um, only because. It's something that affects all of our lives, um, but it's something that we tend to know very little about. Okay, when we're talking about measuring brain development, we're talking about a couple of different things here. Um, but in essence, we're talking about IQ, okay, which stands for intelligence quotient or intelligence tests. There are so many debates in the industry about intelligence tests, what they mean, what they do, what's good and what's bad about them. I will tell you a couple of different things about intelligence tests before we get into this. And I'm talking now about the second one here. Okay, Intelligence tests are tests that were originally developed by a French psychologist and have evolved quite a bit, many, many iterations, many, many changes over the years, but were originally developed by a French psychologist to test the skills and abilities that one would need to do well in school. And this is important because the only thing that intelligence tests tend to definitively show is how well somebody will do in school. So people who do well in school tend to do well on intelligence tests. People who do well on intelligence tests tend to do well in school. That's not to say that intelligence tests don't have other benefits and don't have other meanings. People argue that they do. But the one consistent finding is that there's a relationship between intelligence tests and school success. Okay? Now, there are always, always groups that underperform on intelligence tests, and there's always groups that overperform on intelligence tests. And, you know, you have to remember, these were tests that were normed, tested, and built on a very specific population. And so naturally, when you build a test on a homogeneous population, a small population, and you try to translate that to a larger population, the test is not going to be representative. And there's a big argument in the industry that these intelligence tests are culturally biased. Okay, um, So, you know, it's always one of the caveats when people talk about intelligence testing. Um, you know, are they culturally biased? And the argument, the general consensus is yes, that they are culturally biased. Um, so they tend to not be the be-all, end-all measure of, of intelligence, right? Again, they, they do a better job at predicting school success. That doesn't mean that they don't have some value they do right they can certainly indicate some cognitive functioning okay meaning they can indicate how the brain is sending information back and forth okay in general and obviously there are caveats to this but it can indicate how the brain is sending information back and forth and so what we look at in the normal intelligence test is we typically use these things in schools um, in order to try to figure out how the child's brain is working and what types of information the child does well with and what types of information the child doesn't do well with. So without going into the intelligence testing thing much further, I'll say one of the, the big intelligence tests, one of the more popular ones, tests for what they call two different types of thinking. Um, they call um, concrete learning um, and uh, processing speed. So concrete learning is your learning and memory for facts, for pieces of information that don't change. Um, so vocabulary would be this concrete learning, or what we call crystallized learning. Um, let's see, a uh, What's another example of crystallized learning? Um, so facts about history would be an example of crystallized learning. The other type of learning is what we call processing speed, how fast you take in and process information. Um, and so this would be what we call fluid intelligence, so problem solving. So if I gave you a puzzle to put together, um, that might be an example of processing speed or, or problem solving. And so in essence, you might have a child that's not doing well in school. They might be referred to a guidance counselor or a school psychologist. 
um, who might do some testing and they might give an IQ test and the IQ test might show, wait, this child does very well with you know problem solving, but they don't do so well with memorizing facts. So we need to help this child somehow to memorize facts. So then you might develop what we call an IEP, an Individualized Education Protocol, um, where the child has a special education curriculum where they have resource room, they might have tutors, um, and they have help, you know, navigating them through their difficulty. So somebody's tutoring them and helping them with the areas in which they struggle. Okay, um, that's where IQ tests are most commonly used. They can be used in other areas as well, but they tend to take a very long time to do. They can only be administered by a licensed psychologist. They tend to be very expensive. And so they're really only used in the public schools and usually in the context of children who are typically struggling, okay? Um, because we just don't have the money to give it to everybody and it takes a lot of time. Now, that's different from aptitude and achievement tests, okay? Let me talk about achievement tests first because they're a little bit easier to understand. An achievement test is testing a body of knowledge, what you've already learned. Okay, so the LSAT, so, so, so the, sorry, not the LSAT, forgive me. Um, so the New York State Bar, the licensing exam for attorneys, um, the medical boards, I think the NCLEX is the nursing exam that you take after you've graduated nursing school, um, the, the medical boards, the psychology licensure exam, the architecture exam, all of these exams are what we call achievement tests. They're tests that test, do you know enough in the field to practice on your own okay those are achievement tests they're specific they're specific to the field they ask specific types of questions about specific information in the field and they want to make sure that you know enough in order to basically practice without supervision or be a licensed professional okay that's an achievement test that's very different from an aptitude test an aptitude test is a test that measures your likelihood of success. It's a test that's supposed to that's supposed to guess how well you're going to do on something. And believe it or not, you've all taken an aptitude test. Okay, the SATs are an aptitude test. Or the SAT is an aptitude test, I should say. It stands for scholastic aptitude test. And what this test does is it's a decent predictor of how well you're going to do in your first year in college. Okay, I'll say it again. It's a test that predicts how well you're going to do your first year in college. Now, there are always exceptions to this. There are people who do well on the SAT and do poorly their first year. There are people who do poorly on the RSAT and do well their first year. But the SAT's predictive ability only works for the first year in college. There's no relationship between your SAT score and your second year in college. This is one of the reasons why if you do poorly on the SATs, a lot of students will go to schools that might be a little bit easier to get into, um, do well that first year in school, and then transfer. Because in essence, your SATs are not as important to the colleges in your sophomore, junior, and senior year. So let's say you do poorly on the SATs, you go to Kingsboro, you get a 3.5 GPA, 4.0 GPA, and then you apply to a different school, you apply to a Cornell, a Columbia. Um, and you know they're not going to care as much about your SATs because your argument is, look, I was in college, I took college level courses, and I had a 3.5 GPA. And so the SAT, which might have been low, is obviously not really relevant right now. Okay, And there are a lot of, of aptitude tests. Um, the LSATs for law school, the um, MCATs for medical school, the GREs, uh, for graduate school, um, these are all what we call aptitude tests, and some of them have better or worse predictability of your success. The GREs only predict your first semester in graduate school, not even your first year. The LSATs, on the other hand, tend to do very well across the entirety of law school. Students who do very well in the LSATs tend to do very well in law school. Students who do very poorly tend to do very poorly, period, across the board. It's a very good predictor. This is not about intelligence or cognitive functioning. These are tests that are specific to specific areas and test your potential for success in that area. 
there are people who do very, very well on IQ tests and do very poorly on aptitude tests and vice versa. And again, we talked about how IQ tests might not necessarily be um, indicative of intelligence. Um, but these aptitude tests are not intelligence tests. Okay, so just bear that in mind because that's very important. All right, let's talk about um, developmental psychology, uh, psychopathology, excuse me, um, and abnormal behavior. So understand that abnormality, and I say this in the abstract sense, um, things that are atypical are normal. Okay, every child does things, for lack of a better term, that are weird, that are odd. They do. That is normal, right? There are no perfect children. There are no completely well-behaved children. Everybody does things that are odd or a little bit different, okay? And serious abnormalities, mental illness, tends to be very, very rare, okay? Especially in children. A lot of the mental illnesses that you'll see in, in adults won't manifest themselves. You won't see visible signs until adolescence, early adulthood, sometimes even middle adulthood. Okay. Now, one of the big psychological disorders that's common in this age, one of the ones that's worth talking about is something called ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Okay. There used to be two separate disorders, ADD and ADHD. And this gets really confusing because they, they made a change, and I don't know why they made this change, but they made a change. About 5% of children, okay, so 1 in 20, um, gets diagnosed with ADHD. The diagnosis of ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, no longer exists. In essence, there are two different types of ADHD. There's ADHD, Attention Deficit Disorder, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, hyperactive type. And then there's ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, non-hyperactive type. The only difference is, is that ADHD hyperactive type has increased energy, the overactivity that you see here, and ADHD non-hyperactive type doesn't have overactivity. Okay, it's the only difference. Don't ask me why, to me it's very silly to call something attention deficit hyperactivity disorder non-hyperactive type, but that's just what they've decided to do. So in essence, um, the three symptoms are inattentiveness, impulsiveness, and overactivity, and that's for ADHD hyperactive type. ADHD non-hyperactive type is inattentiveness and impulsivity. Inattentiveness just means the ability to maintain attention and concentration. Impulsiveness basically means doing things without thinking about them first. And then overactivity is what it sounds like, um, the uh, you know high energy levels, right? Not being able to sit still. ADHD can be very mild um, or it can be very severe. On the more mild spectrum, it could just be somebody who really has a very difficult time paying attention. Um, on the higher levels, on the more severe spectrum, uh, I was working with a girl who had severe ADHD and she would sit in my office and she would spend the entire 45 minute session jumping up and down on the couch trying to hit the ceiling. When she was in a classroom, she had too much energy. She had ADHD, hyperactive type. She had so much energy that she would crawl around the classroom on her hands and knees on the floor barking like a dog for a good part of the day because she just did not know how to sit still. She was so energized and so out of control that um, she really just couldn't function in a typical classroom. Um, and she was really struggling. And that's an extreme example of ADHD hyperactive type, but it can happen. Okay, it's not just somebody who, you know, notices something out the window for a little bit and gets distracted and then goes back to work, right? We're talking about something that gets in the way of the individ individual's ability to function normally, okay? So that's ADHD in a nutshell. Another big one is um, autism, okay? I don't want to talk about autism too much just because it is such a big topic. Um, but let me talk about it in general so because this is one of the more common childhood psychological disorders that we'll see. Autism um, typically can be seen by a professional. You can see signs of it and basic symptoms prior to the age of two. Um, at about two to three years old is when you start seeing it more clearly. Um, and in essence, autism is a neurological condition for the most part, 
um, but it affects us mostly in our areas of social skills. Okay, so the common indicators of autism are delayed language, impaired social responses, meaning that they're not interacting socially or interpersonally, they don't really seem to have much care or use for, for people in their lives, right? Children who are autistic would rather spend time playing with a toy than playing with an adult. And what I mean, I'm talking about six months old, a year old, you know, uh, you know, if you've been around a nine month old, 10 month old, they're always looking up at you. They're always smiling. I mean, obviously they, they get focused on a toy, but they always kind of refer back to you and they seem to care about you, you know, nine months old that might have autism. Um, they kind of want nothing to do with you. You could be in the room and it's like, you're not even there. They tend to have, um, unusual play. Um, children that have autism um, tend to have very repetitive play. They tend to have very rigid play. They tend to put things in order quite a bit. Um, you know, it, it's very mechanized. It's very mechanical, the way that they play with things, okay? Um, I'm not sure if you're able to click on this link in the video that I'm showing you. I'm not even sure if you're able to copy and paste it. Um, the link here that I put in this slide deck in the video is slightly different than the link in the actual slide deck that's online. The actual slide deck link is, is no longer available. This one is the new link. This is the working one. So if you can, I definitely would watch this video. It's a video of, I believe he's 12, a 12 year old boy um, that has autism and he has a tantrum. And you can see what it's like. This is a true autistic tantrum and it's disturbing to watch. So be forewarned. Um, it's very unpleasant to see, but as a child that is struggling with autism and um, this boy has a tantrum and the parents are there to try to manage his behavior. Um, and typically there are things that we can do to help children with autism manage their behavior better, but there absolutely is no cure for it, despite what Jenny McCarthy might say. There are no medications for it. Um, we still really know very little about it. We don't know what causes it. We really have, again, behavior modification treatments where there's certain things that we can do to try to change the behavior, um, but we can't cure it, okay? Not yet, at least. Um, we don't know what causes it. There is no valid research to indicate that there's a relationship between vaccines and autism. We don't have research to support that. Okay, it doesn't exist. Um, again, I'm not sitting there saying that it, it, it's 100% not, but there is no research to date to support it at this time. Okay, and that's very important. Um, so, autism is a social skills disorder. It, it, um, it causes severe difficulties um, in, in social and interpersonal interactions. Uh, it tends to be a lifelong condition, and we tend to see it very, very early on. Okay. Um, the numbers are going up. It used to be one in a thousand, then it was one in 250, then it was one in 150. I think it's now down to, these numbers actually might be a little bit off. Um, it's down to, I, I believe, about uh, less than one, more than one in a hundred um, have, have autism, um, have signs and symptoms of autism. So, and again, we're not really sure why or where that's coming from. Okay, but there's a lot of research in the field. Um, they think there might be a genetic component to it. It's possible that there might be a virus that, that the mother might have been exposed to while, while she was pregnant. Again, these are all possibilities, things that people are researching, but nobody really knows for sure yet. Um, so it's, it's very, very new, the, any information that we're getting on autism. Okay. Um, there used to be a condition called Asperger's syndrome which was discovered by a gentleman named Hans Asperger. Um, I believe he was German, he was a researcher, and he discovered this, I believe it was in the 1930s or 40s. Um, but what we've realized is, is that um, Asperger's syndrome is really just what we would call a mild form of autism, okay? Um, meaning that um, it's autism, but just more mild symptoms. So in essence, we have mild, moderate, and severe autism now, where in the past it used to be Asperger's syndrome was one, uh, autism was another, there was something else that was called sensor integration disorder. All that has been folded into autism. It's mild, moderate, and severe autism now. That's it. No more Asperger's. Okay. All right. Now, um, as far as, you know, disorders go wrapping up, um, just 
one big thing to understand is, and I mentioned this before, is that every child is different. Okay, every child is going to um, be a little bit different, and that's fine, and that's okay. The thing to understand when we're talking about your, your children and knowing if your child is different or not, um, or knowing if there might be something wrong or not, is one of the best indicators or one of the best people who can indicate is actually your child's teacher. And one of the reasons for this is because when your child is in a classroom surrounded by other children, it's easy to compare your child's behavior with another child. Okay. And what I mean by that is, is that no child, no five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old can sit still for eight hours. Nobody can. But your six-year-old should be able to sit still for a half hour, 45 minutes. And if every other six-year-old can sit still for a half hour or 45 minutes, but there's another six-year-old in the room that can't sit still for four minutes at a time, I mean, they're just it's torture for them. It's easy for the teacher to sit there and say, well, this child is clearly struggling with this. And so a lot of the times, the first person to notice if your child is struggling is, is a teacher. Um, and it's not uncommon for the teacher to identify it. Plus, the teacher tends to be a little bit more objective. You know, as parents, it's hard to, you know, see anything with your child that might be, you know, not common or, or a little bit different, right? So just... Bear in mind that, that, you know, there's always the possibility that the teacher might see something, they might notice something. And it's not to say that they're always right, and it's not to say that they're always objective. But they can be a good sort of first indicator if there's something with your child that might, that might need to be addressed. Okay? All right. Um, there's an assignment this week. Um, I will post information about the assignment this week uh, on announcements, as always. Please, 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 if there are any questions or problems, please email me. I try to get back as quickly as I can. Again, the email address is on the syllabus. Um, I've posted it a couple of times, but um, I'll say it again. It's david.troy at kbcc.cuny.edu. Email me 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter. I will try to get back to you um, as quickly as I can. All right, any questions, problems, or concerns? Okay, all right, we only have a couple of weeks left. Uh, again, I'll post uh, information about the assignment this week. and. Um, Hopefully you enjoy the rest of the week.